My name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on motivation. So first, it's obvious that instincts play a profound role in our motivation. So let's start with Freud's life instincts, or eros as he called them. We have a drive for basic survival and reproductive measures. So yes, eros is kind of like our sex instincts. We also have death instincts, or what he called thanatos, which is the unconscious desire to die. And this makes sense because, let's be honest, life can really freaking suck sometimes. Furthering the discussion on instincts, the collective unconscious by Jung, who is the supposed heir to the psychoanalytical throne, claimed we have subconscious needs to fulfill our instincts. He called these instincts archetypes. Simply, archetypes are a model image of a thing or person, such as a father or mother figure, but it encompasses the role you expect from them and the motivation to fulfill these roles, kind of like role theory for the archetypes. Aside from Jung's collective unconscious, there is the personal unconscious. The personal unconscious is your unconscious, which contains your own memories and experience. So the personal unconscious is just the personal version of the collective unconscious. Pretty simple. And due to the nature of the names, they are rarely accessed via your consciousness. Now, McDougall created the instincts theory which stated we are motivated by our instincts. He claimed that there are 18 core instincts, but you don't really need to know them. Just remember that instinct theory is a motivation by instincts. Now, instincts can be parallel with needs. Take, for instance, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow states that we are motivated to fulfill these needs, which states there are physiological needs, such as food and water, then safety needs, such as a house, then belonging and love needs like relationships, and esteem needs like accomplishments. Esteem needs are similar to what McClellan coined a need for achievement, which is self-explanatory. You know, you need achievement. And finally, the need which many people do not actually reach, self-actualization, which is achieving one's fullest potential. The people that reach this level are more likely to have what Maslow called peak experiences, or experiences involving significant, fulfilling, spiritual events. Kind of like the day that you created your Facebook account. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Rogers did expand on Maslow's self-actualizing need to say that we all have the basic motive, which he called self-actualizing tendency. It's self-explanatory, but the tendency is simply the desire to achieve the fullest potential that we possibly can. Now, extensive new research has recently discovered a new need, which is put even before physiological needs. Do you know what it is? Wi-Fi, exactly. The ultimate human need. Utterly impossible to function without it. The bottom two tiers of the pyramid are basic needs, while the top three tiers are considered psychological needs. Now, this is identical to Murray's theory of psychogenic needs, which states there are primary and secondary needs. The primary needs are water and food, like Maslow's basic needs. And secondary needs are psychological needs, like Maslow's psychological needs. So the theory of psychogenic needs is identical to Maslow's basic and psychological needs. Easy to remember. Additionally, Karen Horn and I developed the 10 neurotic needs, which are needs we use to combat anxiety, summarized into three neurotic trends involving moving towards people, against people, and away from people. Interestingly, Horney was rather promiscuous in her life and later had relations with sociologist Eric Fromm, who created a similar but low-yield eight universal needs, all of which included Horney. I'm just kidding. But these eight universal needs are sometimes reduced to just five. These needs took influence from Horney and others, but you don't really have to worry about them. You just have to be able to connect the universal needs to from. And here's a way to remember it. Because from is spelled with two M's, I think of it like the gravity formula. So the gravity formula is gravitational constant multiplied by M1, multiplied by M2, divided by radius squared. Ugh, physics, I know. But the two M's relate to the gravitational formula, which relates to the universe, aka from related to universal needs. Bam, done. Anyways. Both Horney and Frum claim that there was a basic anxiety as from the loss of connections in the world, 
lack of relationship success, especially from parents, or other bad life situations. The drive to combat anxiety, as stated by Horney, parallels what Adler called the inferiority and superiority complex. The inferiority complex refers to an aspect of yourself which makes you feel inferior, such as being partially socially inept, like most men out there. But you have to compensate for it, right? Social skills are a must, so to compensate or overcompensate, according to Adler, you will do something that gives you a feeling of superiority, the feeling being the superiority complex, such as becoming a doctor to stick it to all those people that made fun of you in the fifth grade for having Tourette's. But that's aside the point. Adler also stated we are motivated and live by fictional finalism, which means motivation based on the ideal future we hold irrespective of its validity, such as sexist ideals, notion of heaven, or possibly even the just world hypothesis is a fictional finalism. The notion that good things happen to good people and vice versa, which we know isn't completely true. Now let's delve into some theories of motivation. First, incentive theory from the mid-20th century states that we are motivated to perform behaviors which provide rewards, like incentives, while simultaneously avoiding punishments. Thus, values we place on these incentives dictate our behaviors and motivation. So incentive theory is similar to what's called expectancy value theory, arising two decades later, which stated that we are motivated by goals and the value of that goal, like incentive theory. So incentives versus expectancy and value, etc. But additionally, the expected success for expectancy value theory plays a huge role. In the same decade, self-determination theory came into being, which I like to think of as self-driving theory. Because it's what drives us or motivates you, and because self-driving cars are freaking awesome. Think of the acronym CAR, C-A-R, which defines the three needs of self-determination theory. Competence, aka your self-efficacy, autonomy, aka your degree of choice, and relatedness to the community of involvement. Self-determination theory sounds very familiar to the idea of external and internal locus of control, if you remember. These locus of control were created by Rotter and outlines where you think your life's fate lies. Your fate and self-efficacy is exemplified in the quote by Confucius. He who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. Now next, let's talk about drive reduction theory, aka drive theory. And it exclaims that when we lack fulfillment of our primary and secondary needs, also called drives, we enter a negative state motivated to fulfill these needs. When needs are met, we enter a state of calming homeostasis. Now there are types of motivators. For instance, internal motivators, also called intrinsic motivators, are based in personal rewards such as excitement, happiness, or fun. In contrast, you're probably familiar with external motivators, also called extrinsic motivators, which involve things external to oneself like food, Grades, avoiding jail, following orders, whatever. External motivators can sometimes lead to the overjustification effect, which is when the extrinsic reward, which is when the extrinsic reward like money, decreases our internal motivation. For example, what experiments outline this overjustification effect perfectly? Festinger's experiments are a perfect example. When giving people $20 to do a boring task, subjects rated the task as boring because they overjustified this large sum of money as their motivation, not because they were actually excited for this really boring task, which would be an internal motivation. But the group given a dollar was not the overjustification effect, but the minimal justification principle, which states that the $1 group uses cognitive dissidence to convince themselves that the boring task was actually kind of fun because they didn't really get paid much, so they didn't have much external motivation. They had the minimal external justification, the dollar, so their internal motivation had to compensate for it. Have you ever heard the phrase, less is more? Well, how about less external motivation is more internal motivation? Has a nice ring to it, huh? Well, less leads to more effect, states that when external rewards are low, 
our internal motivation will become greater. Like in the $1 scenario, less external motivation is more internal motivation. Less is more effect. And that's the end of the episode.